Christie, uh, and welcome uh, to this session at the ETP Annual Conference on Energy Policy, uh, People and Society. Uh, my name is Stuart Galloway. Uh, I'm a Professor of Electrical Engineering at Strathclyde University, uh, and I'll be the Chair for this session this afternoon. Uh, we have a good range of speakers uh, who you can maybe see are identified uh, on the slide that's on the screen. Um, so firstly, we have an industry speaker from a, a new SME uh, who will be speaking first. And then we've got some uh, a speaker from uh, MIT and then also a few presentations from Strathclyde. And you can see that we're covering quite a wide range of issues uh, across this theme. Uh, so hopefully, like me, you'll be looking forward to uh, an exciting uh, afternoon's worth of presentations. Let me just say a quick word on the format. The speakers, um, the, the, the speakers, uh, not the industry speaker, but the other speakers have been asked to do a 10 minute or so presentation. And then there'll be a little time for questions at the end of each talk. So you can use the chat function to um, identify your questions uh, or you can hold them over to that uh, segment at the end. But we will also revisit all of the talks at a discussion session at the end. So if you don't get your question answered immediately, we can revisit it uh, at that session at the end. So thank you very much. Hopefully you, uh, you'll enjoy the session this afternoon. And let me begin by handing over to our first speaker, uh, Anastasios, who's going to tell us a little bit about his company and how that links into this particular session. Thank you very much. Stuart, many thanks for the uh, introduction. I'm very happy to be uh, participating in this uh, uh, session, really. Uh, hi to everyone uh, looking at us on, online. My name is Anastasios, Anastasios Rusis. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Smart Power Networks. Uh, as Stuart said, we are uh, an SME. We are a provider, technology provider, essentially. We provide control and automation solutions for energy systems. Uh, today, essentially, what I want to do is uh, uh, give you a little bit of an overview, if you want, how uh, we started the business between myself and my business partner. Uh, we've done years and years of research. I'm going to start from, from the team. I'm going to focus the presentation quite a lot around our story there for myself and my partner. So, as I said, we've done so, so many years of, of research. Uh, we've studied across various degrees, uh, you know, bachelor, master's, PhD uh, in several universities across uh, the world. Most recently, my uh, partner, Dimitrios, has studied in the University of Strathclyde his PhD. Uh, I did also master's in Strathclyde, quite happy about that, I have to say. I've spent three, three good years in, in Glasgow working and studying. And I did my PhD in Imperial College in, in London. Now, um, what I want to stress with uh, really that slide is the fact that when you're trying to start an, a tech SME, uh, what you need is a strong basis of, of uh, technology. Uh, and that's why you typically see you know, tech-oriented founders like myself and my, my partner. But something else that I want to stress quite a lot is uh, uh, in order to move into industry, uh, it's good to have some, uh, I would say, recognizable people backing you in, uh, backing you up. Uh, what you can see here is we have Ian Martz and Nigel Ellis. Both of them are very uh, uh, influential, if you want, people of the energy space in Scotland and beyond. Uh, they have a, uh, a significant portfolio of uh, investments in several start and significant positions also in the industry. So Ian uh, particularly has been the CEO for like 10, 12 years of SSC, one of the key players in the sector in, in the UK. Uh, currently chairman of Thames Water, non-executive director of Agreco, and it goes like that. It is really important to have these people backing you up when you try to go from, uh, you know, research into into the industry. Now, just to go a little bit back, you know, between myself and my partner, we are lucky. So actually, we are very good friends. That's how we started. So, you know, we met in Glasgow 10 years ago where we did our master's degree. You know, as any other young person, what we started doing is, you know, partying, traveling, you know, quite lots, lots of memories to, to remember. But that was only the start, to be honest. What actually connected us deeply was research. Research around several aspects of energy systems. 
So I have done quite a lot of work on optimization. That is, you know, mathematical modeling around uh, energy systems. I've worked on several types of applications, uh, ranging from microgrids to, you know, all the way up to transmission systems, essentially. And Dimitrios has done quite a lot of research on control, protection, stability of networks. And essentially, we spend, I'd say, a good amount of four or five years, really, you know, being locked up in labs. So that the typical uh, rack you see here with Opal RT, the oscilloscopes, we would see that for years and years, you know, doing our research. Uh, in fact, I remember quite a funny story. Uh, there was a period where uh, Dimitrios was locked in a basement in, a royal, uh, uh, in the Royal College of, of Strathclyde. You know, back then it was used before TIC was constructed. And I remember he was locked there. His then uh, supervisor at the PhD was looking for him two days. He sent him an email saying, I came by the lab, where are you? Uh, so th the funny thing is that Dimitrios was there, but actually he was behind the rack. So... The supervisor was getting in, couldn't see him, didn't say anything, and he was leaving. Two days after, he clarified that over an email. So we did that years and years, you know, quite a lot of research. And that led us at some point to realize that, well, okay, publications are fine. But actually, over the years, we developed something that made sense to be commercialized. And we said, why not? Let's try doing that. Let's try to, you know, make an impact in the sector. And that's how we ended up after years and years again of hard working in the business to have a complete product that we call Omega. And that stands for Platform for Energy Dynamics. Now, what that is really is a technology that helps you to holistically uh, supervise, optimize, and control energy assets of all kinds. So we're not talking about electricity assets anymore. It's not only power. We also integrate assets around heat networks as well as uh, uh, transport, electric vehicles, and so on. Uh, it helps you to somehow optimize their operation and even control them on a real-time basis. It is an end-to-end -end approach. We don't simply optimize and then rely on third-party controllers to do the control. We do everything within our solution. Uh, we we've taken a modularized approach, as you can see, comprising both hardware and software modules, depending on the application and the functionalities. I'm not going to speak so much about the technology because that's not really the focus of my presentation, but I'm more than happy to respond to any questions if anyone has anything to, to, to ask. Now, just so that you can understand what is the value, because the technology is great, but what is it that we deliver? Who can we help? So we can help utilities, essentially, and energy service companies. Now, that can be, you know, from TSOs to DNOs, uh, you know, network operators, large scale or smaller utilities and energy service companies even. So businesses that uh, finance, uh, uh, install, maintain, operate microgrids, local energy networks and the lot uh, to better manage their assets. Essentially, what they expect to see when they deploy our technologies, reduced uh, uh, energy losses uh, that relate to the optimization algorithm we have embedded, which uh, somehow leads also to reduced carbon footprint. And that is because uh, what we do is we make sure to maximally utilize local resources, you know, solar PV you may have on a rooftop and stuff like that. And there is another element around increased uh, revenue streams by uh, allowing assets to participate in the energy markets, flexibility markets, for example, and so on and so forth. Now, um, <clears throat> what I want to uh, discuss a little bit is the journey around how you scale the technology from its, you know, idea inception, what we call technology readiness level one essentially to uh, TRL uh, uh, nine, which is full commercial deployment. Now, what we did is we've worked quite quite a lot on securing innovation grant funding, as you can see here in the first two three years. We've been actually very very successful on that, and that helped us to scale the technology to TRL seven without giving up equity, and that is important because. What happens when you get into uh, innovation, you know, grant funded projects is you manage to de-risk the technology. And that is very important, you know, for the market, for investors and so on and so forth. So after, you know, we got in the first one, then somehow it becomes easier to, because you know what it is that you need to do, how you need to go around. You start establishing partnerships, you develop your solution, you further develop your solution. You do some demos, some pilots, trials. These are all, all very important. 
and one thing leads to the other until you land your first commercial products. And on that, we've been uh, as well very, very successful recently because we managed to, to uh, get a very important contract with a multinational ne- network operator, Iberdrola. I'm pretty sure some of you may know it. Uh, there is a chair also, Iberdrola chair in the University of Str- uh, Strathclyde, so the Scottish power chair, uh, essentially. Uh, Iberdrola is a Spanish business that owns uh, and operates networks and assets across Spain, the UK, and the Americas. There is a strong presence in the UK, of course, through Scottish Power. It is a wholly owned business by uh, Iberdrola. And we're going to be deploying our technology very soon at their uh, premises selected substations in uh, in Spain. Now, uh, essentially what I'm trying to say is that through grant funding that helped us de-risk the technology, further develop it, uh, test it, validate it, we managed to land some uh, commercial contracts. Obviously, that wasn't straightforward. So at some point, you know, someone will say, oh, you've been successful on that. Yeah, of course, but success normally doesn't look like that. And I would hope, you know, to, to tell you here by showing that, that every time you have some downs or some maps, you just need to, you know, going forward because every time you have a down, there's going to be a next day, a next week, a next month, you're going to have an up. And success normally looks like that. It's not a straight path, I'm afraid. It's a, a, how, how I normally call it really, the, the, the startup world is an amazing roller coaster. So, you know, we go up and down, not every month, not every week, about, about 10 times a day, to be perfectly honest with you. Every time someone rings you, every time an email comes, you may have an up, you may have an, a down. It doesn't matter as long as you love what you do, as long as uh, uh, there is clear impact of the technology you are trying to bring to the market, then uh, by pushing forward, you will uh, uh, manage it. It is very, very important to keep that in mind. And most importantly, again, around success, you see, we all hear on the startup world about these success stories of, you know, the likes of uh, Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg, you know, these guys that are in the top places here and there. But actually, no one ever says about all the other people that haven't managed to be in the top places or even for the ones that are in the top places, what they have gone through until they reach that place. So, you know, every now and then we go and give a talk like the one I'm giving today to you. And, you know, you're just here to speak about your success, right? But what is hidden behind that is everything else you see on the bottom of my screen. And particularly what I want to quite a lot stress is this bit here, this block here, sacrifice. So essentially what you have to do is a lot of sacrifice. If you believe in what you're researching, if you love what you're researching and you think that it can have an impact in the world, do follow that, do make the the appropriate sacrifices and you will be successful in whatever you want to uh, uh, you want to do. And that can be both research or industry. It doesn't matter. It was just my path to, to you know, go into the industry. For someone else, maybe, you know, to stay in academia forever. With the ap- uh, uh, appropriate sacrifices, you will manage to do uh, and achieve everything you've, you've set for. And that is quite critical, quite uh, uh, crucial, really. I'm closing my presentation. I hope I'm doing all right in terms of, of time, Stuart. And what I want to say is we're a small business. However, we've been doing particularly well and there are a few opportunities for interesting parties to join us. Uh, I'm going to show you my details in the next slide. Uh, Do get in touch if you are interested to discuss opportunities. And that is, uh, uh, you know, either permanent position or even uh, internships, uh, if you want, because I'm sure quite a few students are uh, looking at uh, at us at the moment. I'd be more than happy to to discuss uh, options. Uh, thank you very much for, for the time If and the attention. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to, to respond. Thank you very much, Anast- Anastasios. That was a very interesting kind of personal account of, the, of your experiences so far. We've got, we've got one question uh, in the chat, which basically says, is there anything you would have done differently now um, looking back? Um... Too many things, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. Too many things. Uh, the thing is that what cannot be bought, cannot be given to you, is the experience. So the learnings that you get. Now, in my second startup, I would probably do too many, too many things differently. You know, 
when we are gonna race for the first time, how we're gonna go around protecting the technology with patents, copyrights and stuff like that. Who would be the right partnerships for us to reach the market quickly? All these are things that I would probably do different. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. But as I say, learnings, experience is not something that can be bought. And I think mm -hmm. the whole journey includes this, this bit of, you know, experience really. And that is something I would never have changed. What we learned through the process is great. Not, not only because of the technical aspects, really, if you want, but rather that is a quest to learn yourself as well, if you want, you know, that is very, mm -hmm. very important. You learn what you are built to do in this, in this world. And, other, and that is, that is really great. I think that sounds very good. Um, I mean, I have a question myself, which, um, which is, I, I can see that you are working with some quite big companies and some of them do similar types of uh, jobs to you, like the, you know, the, the power companies and so forth. Why do you think they want to engage with you? Why don't they just try and do these things themselves? Why do you think there's a space for SMEs in this sector? Ooh. Oh, see, we have lost Anastasio, so that's okay. Not to worry. We'll maybe get that question at the end. That's fine. So I think we're going to move on to our next speaker now. Um, so our first um, researcher who's going to be speaking uh, is Elvis uh, Cow. Uh, who's uh, at uh, Cornell, but is, used to be at MIT. He's got to tell us about some work he's been doing in uh, like upscaling uh, carbon tech. So hopefully we'll find that uh, particularly interesting. I'm certainly looking forward to finding out a bit about it. So um, I'll just hand over to Elvis now and he can do his presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much for the nice uh, introduction. And today, I'm going to talk about uh, the next of technology business policy, and I will use uh, focus uh, on carbon tech and talk about our experience and what is happening in the general field to upscale carbon tech. So currently, uh, I'm a postdoc in my fellow and MIT Climate Sustainability Consortium, and the work I'm uh, talking about today is a, a combination of what I did during my PhD in Cornell and also at MIT. So today's session, I'm going to talk about First, the CCUS landscape, and second, uh, our own experience to upscale our research in, uh, in an international competition. And then we we'll go through some policy landscape for this field. And lastly, we'll talk about some ongoing work on benchmarking and evaluation of the technologies. So first to give you uh, the landscape. So just uh, last year, uh, I think early, no, early this year, the IPCC, they re released a landmark climate change uh, 2021 report. And as BUC puts it, the IPCC report, it's cold red for hum humanity. So basically there are two takeaways uh, from this slide. First, climate change is widespread, rampant and intensifying. Second, we need to have ambitious goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to avoid uh, a further increase in global temperature. But how do we deal with these greenhouse emissions, especially carbon dioxide? So that brings us to a topic of carbon capture, utilization, and storage, which I referred to CCUS. So first you need to look at where you can capture that uh, carbon. So look, look at different sources of, of, of CO2, then could power plants, transportation industry, uh, accumulation, and then different methods of capture CO2. And after that, uh, you need to either store the CO2 or utilize the CO2. And uh, just a couple of years ago, Audi has been conducting research on this field. And this gives you uh, an illustration of, of the whole process with CCUS. So here is to show a summary of the different capture methods to evaluate uh, these different approaches you need to look at first how uh, the cost will be and uh, what the, uh, uh, the the impact environment will be and the water consumption and air required for the different capture processes. And here I just want to show you there's so many uh, methods out there to capture CO2. And so there, after you capture the CO2, there's also a lot of uh, things you can do with the capture CO2. You can easily convert that into carbonate uh, through a mineralization process. You can also convert CO2 into uh, chemicals. And 
you can also do biological uh, conversion. So in today, I will focus on one specific conversion method, which is convert CO2 into fuels. And when you talk about that, uh, there are still a lot of methods you can do to achieve this CO2 to fuel conversion. You can either do a stepwise uh, conversion by uh, converting CO2 into building blocks first and then convert that into longer chain hydrocarbons. You can also do a, a direct convert conversion, but the efficiency really low. And all, again, this shows you there's even for the CO2 to fuel conversion, there are so many different opportunities there. And so we need to evaluate uh, the different pathways from not only the technical readiness, but also their timeline for adoption from commercialization. And what we think is super important is how to upscale these different processes. So that brings me to the next section to talk about our own experience in how we upscale our research from a lab scale uh, reactor to a large scale uh, application. So this is actually just a summary to, to compare where we were when we studied the project and where we are after a few years of scaling up this process. And speaking of, speaking of upscaling, that will include uh, upscaling from multiple aspects. For example, device scale up uh, and scale up of materials production and also scale up of financing. So today I will focus on how to scale up the, the devices first. So when you talk about scale up the devices, it's, this is a regional reactor looks like this. You can either do diame diameter scale up and you can also do a lens scale up and you can also consider to operate the reactors in parallel. That's also a scale up process. And uh, so for scale up of the diameter, you can see this is the small uh, diameter reactor and after scaling up, looks like this. And this is our reactors operating in parallel. This is also related to scale of the devices. And as I mentioned, there's also scale of lens, which is a little bit difficult because uh, the, the rationale of doing that is because if you don't scale up, if you just shine light from one side, the light will experience exponential decay. And after a certain distance, there's no light. And uh, I forgot to mention our reactor is based on uh, photocatalysis. So if there's no light, there's no reaction. So by uh, doing some uh, modification to the surface of the web guidance uh, devices, we can shift this uh, original light distribution to this. So by doing that, we have a better distribution of the light along the whole distance that is related to lens scale up. And I talk briefly about uh, Carbon X Prize, and this is a, uh, an overview uh, of the whole uh, Carbon X Prize. This is a study in 20, uh, 2016, and we were fortunate to be one of the 10 teams in the final round, and our team focused on how to convert CO2 into uh, uh, fuels, and this competition also include technologies that convert CO2 into bioplastic, and into other materials such as building materials. And this is a 20 million competition uh, focused on carbon conversion. These are 10 startup companies I just talked about. And uh, so, for, so this is our uh, uh, technology recently featured by uh, a U of T professor. And we were really great to see the technology grow over the years, not only uh, we, we have uh, developed uh, scale of devices, but also we went through a successful commercialization. So uh, I, I, when we talk about commercialization, I think it's also super important, especially right now to do uh, a summary of the policy landscape of the, of the, the field. And for CCUS in, in EU, uh, for, for carbon capture, I think the policy drivers the included tax uh, credits, subsidies, green, uh, premium, premium and preferred market. So the EU, they have European emissions trading system and Finland become the first, first country to do that. And then later there's other countries who contribute to this effort as well. Uh, re most recently, I'm super excited to see China launch its camp and trade model in this July. And because China is the number one carbon emitter in the world, it's super important to see that is growing in China. But the problem is right now, the carbon market, uh, 
it, it closed at around $8 uh, per ton of CO2, which is a pretty low price. And we, uh, in the region, in order for this to really uh, work, we have to raise the, the price uh, significantly so that the carbon market can be up and running. And here I would like to use a case study of the medicinal production for Iceland uh, as, as an illustration to show in order to make innovation happen, you have to have uh, uh, integration of a policy support, financing and technology. So first of all, uh, why this is successful in, in, in uh, Iceland is because the, the cost of electricity in Iceland is really low, is lower than other locations as they have recently uh, get access to hydro and geothermal energy. And this provides a renewable and inexpensive source of hydrogen, which is a key resource that they use to mix with CO2 to make methanol. And then the, the flue gas uh, utilization is very uh, concentrated in CO2 compared to other places. And also the European Commission, they have policy directives. As a consequence, the methanol derived from CO2 does not, uh, does, does not have to compete directly with fossil fuels and is economically feasible when compared to biofuels and other renewable fuel uh, resources. So uh, finally, I would like to talk about, give you a, a brief overview of uh, what is also important uh, that we believe uh, in the field is benchmarking and evaluation of technologies. So this is the different stages of evolving technology and I wouldn't go into details uh, due to time concern, but here just to show we need to, have something like an uh, in-rail chart to keep track of technology development over time. And at the same time, the TE analysis will help us to evaluate the technologies better. So finally, uh, uh, I'd like to thank the, uh, our collaborators and our funding agencies. And I'm open to questions. Thanks very much, Elvis. That was a very uh, interesting talk. Um, I think we've got any questions directly in the discussion forum yet. So if I can just ask a quick one, which is basically, I mean, what you're suggesting is that there's more pressure on countries to take this sort of thing seriously. And do you think we're going to see an, an, an even more accelerated uptake of the adoption of these kind of, you know, measurement technologies where they're measuring emissions and so forth? What's your, what's your view on all of that? So could you say that again? Sorry, I couldn't hear very clearly. No, that's okay. Um, what I was asking really was about the, uh, the like more pressure coming from governments as they start to deliver on their net zero targets. Do you think there's going to be more interest in your type of work? And um, and is this an area you think they will try and pick up on? Like they'll force it into various sectors? So uh, the question was about so right now uh, the multi governments they have the net zero targets and you are you suggesting uh, uh, will that affect the adoption of the technologies? Yeah. Right on that, that yes. Okay. I definitely definitely yes because one of the key components for CCUS uh, affecting the upscale process is the, the policy support and we, I, as I mentioned here the policy incentives here. Uh, for example, the tax credits offered by the government, they actually uh, offer a great uh, revenue for the current CCUS industries. And, uh, but in addition to the policy support, I do think uh, multi-sectors need to work together. Because right mm -hmm. now, for example, at the consortium uh, and MIT right now, we have a climate and sustainability consortium, which is to uh, connect uh, uh, the different big industries with startup community and with the research community. So we we think uh, positive support is important, but at the same time, with that positive support, we need to get multi sectors to work together collaboratively because climate change is, is an urgent issue. And yeah, I, I hope I answered your question. Uh, I think so. And, I, think, yeah. I think so. Thank you very much. So hopefully we'll get back to some more questions at the end. Uh, I think, I mean, thank you for your presentation. It was very helpful. So our next speaker today uh, is um, uh, Luke Gooding, uh, and he's going to tell us a bit more about SLES projects, which I'm not sure I know what that actually means. So that will be a good start. I'll let, certainly learn something here. So uh, over to Luke. Hopefully he's ready to start. Super. Thanks, Stuart. Um, yes, hopefully I can cast a bit of light on, on some work we've been doing with um, smart local energy systems or SLES systems. 
Um, in particular, the research I'm completing is, is looking at how we can get as many voices involved in the decision making about smart local energy systems as possible. Um, and it, it kind of comes in line with, with what Jim Skier was saying on one of the previous um, discussions in this conference around just transitions and making sure um, communities and end users have as much possibility of, of accessing decisions around their energy systems as possible. Um, so in particular, it's, it's looking at how those routes of engagement are evolving in, in present smart local energy systems and, and kind of becoming aware of those. So what are they? Um, this is um, a bit of an infographic provided by um, the Catapult Energy Systems. Um, it's from a project which is a, a UKRI funded um, scheme um, called Prospering for, from the Energy Revolution. And essentially what they wanted to do is um, provide funding to create innovative energy systems of varying types under the banner of smart local energy systems. So they, they are just that, they are embedded in place, um, but importantly, they are they have a digitized element um, and they can take varying forms. And I'll, I'll go into that in a moment, but this kind of gives you an indication of what they could be. They could be um, domestic home facing, they could be business facing or, or even council facing, for instance. And they could be offering a, a new way of looking at how energy is produced, distributed and used um, across those sorts of, of users. In particular, they, they don't actually have any set assets. Um, so some of the schemes we've been working with are, are very much more about um, battery storage, for instance, or much more about mobility and, and provision of EVs, for instance, and also things like low carbon heating. So they have a, a host of those different things within. And the whole idea around this scheme is, is the UKRI really wanted that breadth of projects. They didn't want it to be a, a singular type of energy system. Um, so this is a particular reason why we think looking at the engagement of users in this is so vital because it is so um, broad, the sorts of things that they could be engaged in. Um, and also there's this digitized element means that there's chances here of, of things such as peer-to-peer -peer energy trading or better flexibility in how energy is distributed and, and the supplies are utilized. Um, and also it's about ensuring that we're using it really intelligently, whether that's um, energy efficiency in homes, for instance, or, or ensuring the management is correct. So that's kind of an overview of, of what it could be. And as you can see by the date here, this is a, a 2020 infographic. So this has then formed kind of the, the foundation of what actually has been produced on the ground. So why are we interested in this from engagement? I kind of hinted at it then, but it is to do with the four Ds. And smart local energy systems are looking to decarbonize energy via three ways. So they're looking to decentralize it, it's very much about providing local solutions which are tailored to place, utilizing resources in, a, in the best way possible, but also, also making sure that the users are tailored for. So whether you're in a place, for instance, which is quite rural, you're gonna have higher mobility demands, for instance, and therefore really tailoring um, electric uh, mobility, for instance. And it's also about digitization. It's about creating better ways in which we can interact with energy and interact with how we use it, how we buy it, who we could possibly sell it to as, as a, as a peer-to-peer -peer trading setup, for instance, but also importantly, it's about democratization, making sure people have a say. Now, if we think about all those things, decentralization, digitization, and democratization, they all require um, us as users to be more involved. If they're gonna work, we need to be more involved. So this um, particular lens looking at engagement, we think is really vital to make sure that these smart local energy systems work, of which there are now um, three demonstrators demonstration projects in the um, Prospering for the Energy Revolution program and are following 10 um, design projects which are being pitched to go to the next stage of implementation. So this is one of them. This is one of the um, demonstration projects which is, is now up and running and it now has people like you and I uh, purchasing the services from it. So this is uh, Reflex Orkney and this is one of the examples of what a smart local energy system has come to look like. So it is looking at various things. In particular, it's looking at tackling the three things. So it's looking at tackling um, electricity, heat and transportation and providing a way in which Orcadians can access cheaper, more reliable, more sustainable forms of electricity and heat um, and then also mobility. And that the way that they're doing that is they're linking up the fact that they have um, a high level of renewables in Orkney, obviously, because they have significant uh, wind and wave and tidal. Um, resources, um, but also the fact that they now have access to, due to some of their heritage around energy innovation, they have access to some knowledge there where they can use 
what they what they've labeled as a flexi grid so that they can access um what they have um, started to sell to Orcadians, the reflex um, tariff, energy tariff, which um, enables cheaper, cleaner energy, but also then they can hook it up to, for instance, a charging tariff. So you, you get preferential charging for cars in off-peak periods, for instance. So those are some of the sorts of things they're doing. This is just one of them. And as you can see, the reason why I think it's important to look at engagement, particularly say if we take the Altman case, is that it interacts with various parts of life. So not only is it interacting with mobility, it's interacting with homes and how we heat them, and how we um, power the things we have in our homes, but also more widely, they're using it to the reflex system to tailor the energy systems for the leisure center in Kirkwall, for instance. And they also have now car clubs for people who don't require a car permanently and also tourists, for instance. And then they're also tailoring how they can produce low carbon heat for houses and businesses on and on Orkney mainland and also some of the outlying isles. So this is interacting with very different parts of Orcadian life. So we think that actually we need to understand how engagement is, is happening and how we can make sure that Orcadians are saying how it really needs to be to meet their needs. So engagement, this is a, a fairly a classic kind of ladder of engagement. This is Arnstein's ladder of participation. As you can see down at the bottom, we've got some fairly non-participatory ways of doing things where people can be manipulated or just consulted on what's happening. But I think we found on over a few recent um, cases, say, take for instance, uh, feed-in tariffs for instance, they're not enabling um, all voices to be heard. And actually in many cases, they're, they're tailored to people with finance or with the means to interact with these measures. And they're not tailoring to everybody. So if we're going to get to the levels, you know, six, seven, eight, where we have high levels of community engagement and even citizen control, for instance, we need to be pushing how we understand engagement to make sure we're doing it the best way possible for everywhere. So what are we actually looking at in this research? We're looking at the fact that even if engagement plans in the first instance are particularly well tailored or particularly well thought through and they've done stakeholder mapping and they've understood who all the different parties are, Actually, when you get to implementation, there's various things, and many of them are, un are completely unexpected, which come in and provide barriers or provide hindrances to that engagement plan. And those can be things such as, you know, resource constriction and, and funding constriction, or even politics and wider policies changing how things should be done or could be done, or even things such as unintended consequences or, or actual the way projects evolve and, and people may leave or companies leave or, you know, those internal changes. So we wanted to understand what kind of things can actually come and hit that project implementation, which means that engagement evolves and perhaps moves away from that original engagement plan. So what does an original engagement plan mean? You know, what, what were people hoping? So we did some workshops with um, three different workshops with three different um, demonstrators within, within the Prospering for the Energy Revolution scheme. And stakeholders or project partners within those smart local energy systems wanted to achieve things through engagement, such as ensuring that a, as bride, a, a broader way, range of benefits could be achieved. And in particular, they wanted to achieve project repli replication. You know, these are businesses, they've got skin in the game, they've got money. So they wanted to ensure that if they were going to invest time and resource, they wanted to make sure that they could perhaps go on and sell the learnings or go to different places and say, we've got an answer for you and we can replicate what we've done here. So that's just one of the aims of project partners that they wanted for engagement. They wanted to engage with people to make sure that they could replicate it. Other ones, they wanted to demonstrate that this was a real value so they could persuade people, they could sell to people. But also people were saying, hang on, at the, at the highest level, smart local energy systems have the means to make everybody a user because everybody's been impacted by climate change. So actually we should be talking to everybody and our engagement plan should be as wide as, and as inclusive as possible. So these are sorts of things that people were saying in workshops, and this was prior to um, smart local energy system implementation. This is in the first stages. So this is what they wanted to do. This is just a few examples. But actually, when we got into the nitty gritty of actually implementing these things, some engagement shifts started to happen. So we found that there was some real forces influencing engagement, such as um, funding. So in multiple cases, people found that actually what they wanted to do, the money wasn't there. And also, the way that the it was pitched through the policies behind this scheme that 
it was, you know, they were perhaps selling as opposed to co-designing with communities. But then there was also things such as resource availability, people. You know, engagement is a time-consuming task where you have to be revisiting and evolving how you view communities. And that's really difficult to do when resources are stretched, as they all are, in, in particularly in these sorts of schemes where there are lots of small um, businesses. Then we had COVID. I'll come on to that. Obviously, that's a big influence on engagement because you can't be in the same room as people, for instance. But then there's also um, unintended consequences. So um, some of the businesses that were involved found that they were being bought out by other businesses and those businesses perhaps didn't share the same vision or the same ways of thinking and that was a real problem for them and how they were planning to engage but also the fact that some engagement methods really missed the mark and they were too technical for instance and communities failed to get in, involved with them and that led to these sorts of um, resultant shifts so in one case they wanted to really have a co-design element so they wanted the community to design this energy system with them but actually due to all those things on the left they had to really recourse and go back to one-way communication, which really missed that opportunity to get the say from multiple parties. COVID obviously came along and that made um, a shift from um, in-person to online and virtual, and obviously all the challenges that, that we still experience now in terms of talking to each other and, and understanding different viewpoints. And also the fact that they had this restriction in funding and resource availability meant that actually sometimes the path of least resistance was relying on existing networks or existing contracts. So those are some of the shifts. But the important thing that we found is, if we're looking at those shifts, what are the impacts? So we've got a recourse to one-way communication, as I say, but also we had a higher level of early adopter uptake because people who were already interested in early adopters, perhaps they were already engaged, they were able to get, enter into the discussions easier because they could go and find out about it, research it because they had an interest. Another impact was the reduction in, in the types and range of stakeholders involved in decision making. And also importantly, reduction in that inter-project collaboration, which I think in an innovative system, um, an innovative project like this is really important. And also just pure delays. And I think COVID is, is a prime example of how things can get delayed, not to mention things such as, you know, Brexit and supply chains and things like that. So what's the potential result of this? So the potential result is there is potential for a reduction in there's a reduction in the range and number of communities, for instance, benefiting. And there's also equity concerns in this idea that are we missing this just transition of who's involved? So what are the lessons? I hope I'm still not running out of time. Lesson number one, I think, is if we're going to achieve a better way of engaging with a system which has the opportunity to imp in impact a wide part of our lives, it needs to have a consistent re-evaluation of the strategies needed to make sure it's effective. It also needs to be tailored we need to make sure that are we actually meeting these people where they're at? Are we talking their language in terms of te technical aspects? Are we meeting them in terms of their priorities? Because, you know, COVID for instance came along and yes, it, it impacted engagement, but actually we started to miss what people were actually prioritizing. For many people, COVID impacted livelihoods and incomes. So why would they be interested in an energy, energy system at this point in time? You know, they're more interested in, in finance and putting food on the table, for instance. And also, Looking at we're making, how we're making adequate routes for people to access decision making. Are we really making this easy for people to come along and say, this is how we need my energy system to look like? So what next? I think this has been used before and I'm sure some of you will, will have seen this, but it, we need to focus on what's strong, not what's wrong. So take Orkney, for instance, they've got an awful lot of people who are really clued up on what energy systems are they've been involved in a in quite a long-standing renewable energy culture um, so they've got loads of knowledge that they want to share so we need to utilize that then there's also this enhancement of institutional listening and this kind of reflective way in which some of these businesses organizations local authorities for instance that are involved how they listen and are they really listening and acting on some of these things which are coming out from the communities and also it's developing systems of governance that respond to emerging systems of participation and ways of participating. Because we found that as projects discover more about themselves and they discover different ways in which they're interacting with communities, they need to respond to that to make sure that they're talking to people about how that interaction is gonna happen. So it's about being adaptive. And also it's about seeing publics or communities as something which can be benefited from, not something that can be controlled or even ignored, for instance. 
So thank you very much for listening and open to any questions or, or ideas or feedbacks or thoughts around that. Thank you. Thanks, Luke. That was very good, actually. Thank you very much. And it's so good, in fact, it's generated some questions in the discussion forum. Okay. You'll be pleased to hear. Um, so I'll try and pick off a couple of these just now, but maybe we'll carry the remainder over to the uh, discussion thing at the end. So Lara has asked a couple of questions. Um, and the first one says she was wondering if smart local energy systems uh, have interacted with procedural and recognition justice literatures uh, and, ap and applications. Um, so uh, could they lend themselves to an interesting on the ground case studies in this field, do you think? What do you think to that? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think in terms of justice, I think they have the opportunity to enhance the way in, w in which people understand energy, interact with energy, um, because they are so wide reaching in terms of mobility, in terms of housing, in terms of heating, in terms of power. They have a way in which they can um, enable people to have more discussion or more decision making opportunity. And I think we've seen coming out in some of the design projects which this, this um, UKRI scheme has come up with, they are incredibly broad. And we have ones which are, for instance, is a project um, in Rugeley, um, just outside Birmingham, where they're looking to change the way in which people interact with energy in a place where it's been predominantly coal, for instance. So they're actually using a um, redundant um, coal-fired power station as a site in which they look to um, produce renewables, they look to um, engage people in. So they've created all these ways in which people can interact. And therefore, I think that way in which um, they're recognizing the past, you know, there's a past heritage there of people working with coal and, and some of the ways in which therefore since the coal industry has left people have been left a bit high and dry with skills that aren't potentially employable at the moment and they're recognizing that actually we can really bring a new system um, which can help with people to interact a bit better um, some of my colleagues involved in this um, in a consortium called energy rev um, they are looking lots more around this um, procedural and recognize recognition justice around um, that so I'd, I'd be very um, happy to point um, Lara to, to some of those, Lara, um, yeah. those literatures as well. Great, that sounds good. And one more question just from Natasha. We'll leave Lara's other question over till the, the end of the session. Okay. So Natasha is essentially asked, asking whether you've found any examples of good practice in public participation or engagement uh, in the things you've looked at so far. Because I know you're saying they're quite diverse, yeah. but still, that doesn't mean to say they're bad. They're just a bit different from each other. So yes. have you found any good practice of, uh, in terms of public participation or engagement? Absolutely. One, one springs to mind. We've been working with um, an organisation where they have decided that their smart local energy system should be entirely technology agnostic. Um, and they want the community, they want to work with the community um, through various methods for the community to design the scheme for them. So they've said, we're not bothered about what it looks like personally from our perspective. We want you to be designing it for yourselves and we will provide ways in which you can access that design process and they have done some really novel and interesting things so one of the things they've done is they are using a theatre company within their town um, to offer essentially well at the moment it, it well it was online sessions but it now is I think it's in person where they can actually take part in theatre um, classes and workshops mm -hmm. talking about their um, the heritage of the town and what energy looks like for them and what it could look like for them and the ways in which they interact with it. And that's had some amazing feedback in terms of the some of the outcomes in which people have been engaged and have been helping to design and, and really participate in that design process. So I think that's one that I think mm -hmm. is just an incredible way of, of, in which they've come up with. In terms of other good practice, we've had some great examples. Um, Orkney is one of them. They, they utilise um, they have a, an organisation called OREF, um, the Orkney Renewable Energy Forum, which is a long-standing um, community forum around renewables. They really utilise that um, participate, um, but the participation of that network within the design of Reflex. Um, and they have lots of crossovers because obviously being an island community, there's lots of people involved in various different um, parts of their community. And they've utilised that really well in terms of um, they have like critical friend groups and they and they show some of the plans to OREF and then they come back with some, with some feedback or some ideas about how it could be developed, for instance. So those, I think, are, are two examples of good practice, of which there, there probably are many more. Yeah, very good. Very different approach. 
and I can certainly think of a few things from my own um, research work in the past that would resonate with very well with that. I think at face, I mean, just just to say it aloud to everybody here, people might immediately think that theatre thing that might they might think that's a bit crazy, basically. But I think people, you've got to let the communities identify what's useful for them, rather than trying to always tell them what to do. So if that's what's the key to unlocking it, then then so be it, basically. Absolutely. And I anyway. think one of the things about this is just just to kind of tie it up is it for, for a smart local learning system to really work, it needs people to really understand the intricacies of what it's trying to do, because it mm -hmm. kind of really works when things are connected and the understanding is connected. Mm -hmm. But obviously, to get to that point, people need to really be brought along with the journey of exactly. like, how all these things map together. Yeah. And how and how do you know exactly what's good for them? The example I was thinking of from my own research, which again was a community-led thing, was um, it was a, a local community. They had their own wind farm, and we were trying to get people to align their energy demand with when the wind farm was basically um, spinning. When it was generating, they'd get cheaper electricity if they were, you know, if they co co aligned their demand with when the electricity was being generated from their wind farm. And you know, so if I'm an engineer, so basically I would have been sending them graphs and lots of different possibilities. But actually, the big thing that worked best was a picture of a horse that was in the local community centre. And when the horse was galloping, there was lots of wind blowing and they should be using energy demand. And when it wasn't galloping or it was just can't, you know, going slowly, it was less an attractive option, which was so that they came up with that idea. And initially, I thought that's, that's pretty crazy. But actually, that was the best engagement piece we had out of everything. So all the, all the effort we put in everything else, that actually unlocked it a bit for that group. So... You know, I'm very open-minded to these things. So that sounds really good. Really good indeed. Anyway, thank you very much, Luke. We'll pick thank up. You. There's some more questions we'll pick up in the chat at the end. Uh, we're going to move on to our next speaker now, um, which is Ben. And he's going to tell us about some land remediation work he's been doing using energy crops, I think. Uh, so just to hand over to Ben. Thank you very much. Am I uh, presenting OK? You can see the presentation. Yeah, looks okay. great. Hello everyone, I'm Ben Nunn. I work in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department of Strathclyde University and I work on the uh, Ceresis project. So I thought I'd use this presentation to introduce the Ceresis project to you and then um, provide a case study of, um, of a contaminated site that I've been working on as part of my PhD. So the Ceresis project is a Horizon 2020 project that's looking to um, provide a win-win a solution to the issues of contaminated land and sustainable biofuel production. So uh, this lady with uh, corn sticking out of her ears, that's Seri. She's the Roman god, goddess of um, of fertility and uh, crops. So she's the, um, that's where the Ceresis comes from. So the project started um, last year and we've got another, another two years um, till completion. So uh, the the Ceresis project is concerns biofuels. So basically biofuels obviously is any fuel derived from biomass and are going, they're going to play a key role on the road to net zero. Um, they could have a role in cutting the carbon emissions from the industry and uh, exciting potential um, with BEX uh, resulting in carbon negative emissions. But biofuels do um, have many sustainability challenges and one of their primary sustainability challenges is the risk of indirect land use change removing land that was previously used um, for food production uh, and moving it towards fuel production and therefore exacerbating the fuel poverty, uh, food poverty. And they also have the same pollution and fertilizer use um, and other sustainability challenges that intensive food crop farming has as well. So the Ceresis um, project aims to meet the, um, the aim of uh, producing biofuels and uh, de land decontamination by uh, meeting three objectives. So the first is to um, demonstrate the suitability and effectiveness of um, energy crops grown on contaminated land. And then also to demonstrate the potential of two novel thermochemical processes, and then to provide a decision support um, for stakeholders and policymakers. So as I'm mostly concerned with objective one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick to what I know and just talk about that uh, for now. Um, so the Ceresis project has uh, many um, partners, both around Europe and internationally as well, uh, with universities, uh, research institutes um, in industry and also NGOs. So far, after just one year, we've set up uh, field trials all over the world. 
And these are field trials with uh, different energy crops. So we've got miscanthus, sweet canary grass, willow, uh, hazel, uh, switchgrass, and, and many other species. And then the contaminants that those crops are growing on range from um, the classic heavy metal contamination to hydrocarbons uh, and POPs and PCBs and other organic um, contamination as well. Uh, and these these field trials are in in the in Europe, as you can see there, and also in Brazil. Here's an example of um, some of the field trials we have going at the moment. So the top left is in Italy, and that's uh, that soil is contaminated with geogenic arsenic. And then on the the top uh, right, that's um, the Govan Dry Docks in Glasgow, uh, just opposite from the SECC, and. Uh, here the soil's been impacted through the uh, use as a dry dock for a long term with both organics and heavy metals. And we've recently planted that site um, with reed canary grass. Um, then on the bottom left is a site in the Ukraine uh, that's been contaminated with transformer oils and pesticides. And, and they planted miscanthus and reed canary grass there. And then some other crops growing in Brazil on a, on a site compacted by uh, chromium and that was a a former tannery. So sites all over the world looking at uh, many, many different issues. Also for the Ceresis project, we've been uh, using biomass that was planted over 15 years ago as part of an EU life project. Um, the biomass you're looking at here is uh, miscanthus, and that's a, a classic bioenergy crop that's um, native to the southeast of Asia. Uh, this, this site here was a former shipyard on reclaimed land and uh, is now part of an industrial estate that's under development. Um, yeah, so basically I just wanted to give you an overview of all the, the range of sites that we're using. So uh, for a case study on contaminated land, I decided to introduce um, historic metal mines, mostly because that's been the kind of key area of my research for quite a long time. So in the UK, we have over 3000 sites impacted by historic metal mines. And they typically remain unvegetated because the mine tailings are too uh, deficient to allow for vegetation regrowth. The sites tend to have high concentrations of potentially toxic elements, uh, many of which um, have impacts on, on human health and ecological health and uh, potential pathways, considering that most of these um, sites are open to the public to a certain extent. And obviously, uh, elements such as lead uh, have uh, developmental impacts for children following ingestion or inhalation. So it's, it's a good idea to do something about these sites. The historic metal mine site that I looked at as part of my PhD uh, was in the northeast of England and is known as White Heaps. And you can see why, because it's completely uh, white. It's a Google, Mer Google um, Earth image there. This site was uh, shut down in the late eighties and has remained unvegetated. And the unstabilized soils, because there's no vegetation on top of them, impact a drinking water reservoir um, lower down in the catchment, where the, uh, the water then has to be treated um, at a water treatment works using ferric sulfate coagulation. We uh, initially took some sediments from this site and, 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 and showed that the, um, the mine was, the, was, the, uh, was one of the contributors. It is in an area of many other mine sites to the impact on the, on the drinking water reservoir. So we took some soil samples and found that the site has typically very high concentrations of elements such as uh, lead and zinc, and then also extremely low uh, nutrient concentrations. So our plan for uh, revegetating and stabilizing this site involved a novel energy crop species uh, known as reed canary grass. So reed canary grass has got a lot of potential on sites like this because it's very high yielding. It's a native species. It's tolerant to both drought and flooding events, uh, has low fertilizer requirements, and uh, importantly, doesn't tend to translocate the contaminants from the soil into the above ground portion of its biomass it tends to keep them in, in the rhizome on, underneath the soil. And it's also relatively underdeveloped for this use. So there's a lot of scope there for using it and developing it further. There's also many ecosystem service benefits to um, using reed canary grass, but I think I don't have time to go into all of them uh, right now, unfortunately. So as part of my PhD, I conducted two field trials on this site, 
um, using reed canary grass and the uh, waste product of the um, water treatment process at the drinking water treatment reservoir that I mentioned earlier. We also used uh, green waste compost, which is municipal compost. And although it looks uh, relatively underwhelming, uh, this picture was taken in, in November and the site is over 1% uh, lead, so uh, physotoxic um, element there. So, and it's remained unvegetated since the 80s, so uh, give the, the grass a little bit of um, leeway. Um, we found significant effects of the amendments from the uh, residue from the water treatment process and from the green waste compost. So uh, good avenues for a circular economy uh, to add nutrients back to the soil there. Uh, we also had plant survival of up to over 90% um, and significant increases in growth for um, species that were developed for the biofuel industry. However, we did find high concentrations of uh, lead in the biomass of, of these plants when we analysed them. So we needed to find out why, because the literature said that the uh, plant wouldn't um, uptake uh, metals into, into the biomass. And that's important because of the downstream process of using this as a, as a bioenergy crop. And also, um, not just the, the process but um, of turning it into a biofuel, but the transportation etc which you don't want to create a dispersal mechanism for for the contaminants in the soil on sites like this so i used a xct to scan the um xct is x-ray computer computed topography so a ct scan um to look at um the density inside the to look at density inside the plant to see if we could pick up where the lead was um before analysis the the plants were washed but uh, even with washing, we found that there was clear globules of contaminant on the plant, and that's most likely lead. And the reason for that is because the most of what you can see in blue there is under about five grams per centimeter cube density, whereas lead is obviously a dense element. It's over 10, it's 11 grams per centimeter cube. So you can spot where the lead is, and basically it's stuck to the plant as, as globs of dirt in the soil and also in the ribs of the um, the plant here. Reed canary grass um, has long leaves um, with uh, ribs in them um, and also little pockets so it's very easy for the contaminant to um, get stuck and that um, gives us an idea of what might need to happen in order to turn biofuel, turn um, this type of bio um, the biofuel crop into a usable biofuel without a uh, taking a lot of contaminant, basically it informs the, the processing, i.e. washing of the plant. So in this short presentation, I hope I've introduced and answered the questions of whether contaminated land can be used um, for energy crop production. Uh, my field trials on part of my PhD show that even on the most highly challenged sites, uh, novel energy crops can, can survive and, and hopefully thrive. Um, the bioregen uh, sites that I mentioned show that uh, brownfield land can support bioenergy crops in the long term. And the Ceresis project will hopefully um, show this on a much greater scale with the range of sites that can be used, uh, range of contaminants and the range of locations. So what's the future for energy crop production on contaminated land? Well, uh, this week I read that Boeing were building a 100% biofuel plane by 2030. And in their publicity, they talk about the issue of indirect land change and the need to produce um, for sustainable biofuel production. So that means we're going to have to start using underutilizing contaminated land. Uh, the Sustainable Aviation Fuel Buyers Allowance also, Buy Buyers Alliance also references uh, the issue of uh, indirect land use and the need for sustainable biofuels. And we're also, um, as a group, currently talking to people working with a, male, uh, a major oil producing company um, to take these sort of trials forward and, and come up with a, with a bigger demonstration trial. So uh, thanks for listening to my presentation. Apologies if it was a bit rushed. It was a 15 minute presentation squeezed into a 10 minute presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. You did a very oh, good job there. Follow Very good job. Um, so we've got um, a few questions. Some of them are my own random thoughts. So maybe I'll pick Luke's question first. Um, he's asked what sort of scale in terms, and he's put hectares, 
of possible contaminated land uh, for biofuel growth is there? Is there any sort of like, and I presume he might mean, he might mean in Scotland or around Glasgow, and then he might mean UK after that possibly. So in the UK and in Europe, we have a lot of, of contaminated sites because we're the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. We've had a long time to impact our soils. Um, I had a figure on one of my slides, which I uh, forgot to highlight, but uh, it was that there's 2.5 million sites in the EU. Um, we obviously have a long industrial history in Scotland as well. And along with the, the, the big sites like um, the old steelworks and the coal sites that we've got, we've also got a lot of smaller sites with impacted soils as well. So there's a massive scope for, for upscaling this, basically. Right. That answers the right. question. Um, so that, I think, I probably answers that in part. Luke can maybe revisit that if we want to go back to it. I had a few random thoughts myself, really, which was, I mean, my questions were, are these things grown as monocultures, basically? It's all the same plant in the same place, or does, it, does that matter? I think you could uh, mix the, the, the crops together. You, you have um, different timelines on some of the crops. Some of them can be coppiced uh, regularly, uh, after establishment yearly and others would be longer term like uh, willow for example yes um it would just depend on the the harvesting uh, method mm -hmm. basically I, I guess that that's sort of further down the line is working out uh, whether you can do multiple species on the same i just wondered i mean I, know, I mean i understand from a scientific point of view that you're examining these things and it might that's how it looked to me it was one type of plant but i just wondered and the other thing I was going to ask, which is, and it's just about the mechanics of it, I think you maybe caught it at the end of there because you mentioned 15 year cycles. I'm wondering if you're with an area of land, whether you would plant, I mean, this is if you were operationalizing it, you would plant it and then harvest it and then and then keep replanting and harvesting on the same site. Is that how it would be done? Uh, yeah, you'd, it, these sites are underused, so you'd be finding a new use for the site. So one day hopefully there'd be an incentive whether through um sort of carbon credits or or an industry based around this you'd be using the sites in the same way uh, as, as as a type of agriculture so yeah like the field be, like, yeah and, you know and if i can maybe just add one more thing while i remember which is i have yeah. seen examples of this where people have co-located renewables onto the site so they've under under planted sorry, well, you've put up basically raised solar panels, raised solar panels above the, so you've got the landmass, raised solar panels, but underneath it, they've planted. Now, they're not intended, to, they weren't intended to crop that, because obviously the, the solar panels get in the way, but that, I could see there's, there's a, there was a, you know, a dual effect there, really. The idea was you generate energy from that, you know, a site, maybe in a city or something like that, and then at the yeah. end of it, you'd get uncontaminated land and it'd have more commercial value whether it was local authority or anything like that. I mean, do you think there's any prospects for that kind of thing as well? I think basically if we can if we can get Beck sorted out, if we can store the carbon, there's a fantastic opportunity for using every scrap of land possible. So yeah, mm -hmm. combining it with renewables would be would be great. But that's the the bit that needs to be that would create a massive incentive to do this because obviously plants are great at sucking carbon out of the sky. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Right, so maybe we'll pick up the remaining questions uh, in the Q&A at the end. Thank you very much, Ben. That was Thanks very good and well done for trying to stick to time. You did a good job there. Thank you. In, in different areas, but they, are kind of, they all touch on the same sorts of things. You know, they've either got, they either, they either fit very well with the title, so it's either energy and policy or it's people and society, but often it's a mixture of these things uh, that are coming together. And I think what we'll find, just as we might find with net zero, it's actually a multiplicity of things that are coming together. And it's going to require us all to basically collaborate and work with new diff new types of people to bring new, so you know, to bring things together, to find new solutions for how we can make things actually happen. I mean, just Kusum's there was, she was talking about sustainable policy. Net zero is not something we can just chop and change out of. We're going to have to have a consistent message that's pushing us through to these longer term goals. And uh, I think all of the things we've heard this afternoon somehow touch on the delivery of all of that. They're not in, the, in themselves the, the key solution, but they all bring some um, contribution to that longer term sort of arc. 
I mean, maybe I'll just say to the presenters, is there anything you wanted to say? You've had a chance also to hear some of the other presenters work. Is there anything you want to ask or is there anything you want to say in response to any of the things that have come up, for example? Um, just to resonate really from my side, Stuart, very happy to see a breadth of different approaches and technologies, if you want, coming together towards the energy transition. And just to, to really state, as you said, there is no one fit for all uh, solution. We're going to have to go around and, you know, tailor the packages and the sets of technologies we have pen depending on, you know, the applications, the functionalities, the backgrounds of people, as was noted recently uh, in the last presentation. Uh, I think, mm -hmm. I think that, that is really key and it's really good to see research across the various areas that can bring together uh, all these aspects necessary to allow yeah. an effective absolutely. energy transition. Yes, no, absolutely. Thank you, Anastasios, that's really helpful. So unless, if there's no other points that any of the speakers want to make, Ben, you look like you're itching to say something, but maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> okay, in that case, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you also to all our speakers this afternoon. Thank you very much. You all did a great job in keeping us informed and up to date with where the current research are, is in this area. Um, thanks also to the people in the audience. Um, really, thanks for staying with us and asking some really good questions. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll keep in touch with the ETP. Um, it's a really good uh, collaboration across a number of universities. And, you know, you might there's lots of different ways of connecting in with it. So please do keep that in mind. And 